Bless her once again. Let's give our God a shout of praise. Thank you, Lord, for all you are and all you do. If you're with us online, welcome. If you're with us in the building, welcome. At this point in time, we invite you to stand as we respond to the Lord as one family in song. the Lord who forgives all our sins, his mercy endures forever. Mighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. As we prepare to celebrate the mysteries of Christ's love, let us call to mind our sins. Most merciful God, I confess that I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I have done and by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I am truly sorry and I humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and forgive me that I may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen.
choice today.
Mighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome. Welcome all those who are here in person, all those who are joining us online. We gather together as one church family. And if you're new to Intercessor, we just love to connect with you. Uh, we make that connection in person in the lobby with a host. On our online campus, we make a connection with a virtual host, someone who's there to uh, meet you. But also, if you're watching uh, from another platform at a different time, go to intercessorchurch.com. There we can make that connection with you. I would encourage you, if you haven't done so yet, it's regularly being updated. Download our Intercessor Church app. It's a shortcut to our website. It'll give you announcements or information, what's going on. It gives you the ability to begin or, or apply morning prayer, that you can read the scriptures and join along with all those who are participating. Uh, it gives you uh, my notes, which are outlines of sermon notes that you can take um, uh, during the sermon. So this way, if you want to look at your phone and pretend you're taking notes, you can do that. Um, you can sit there and fill in the answers, but use those in our community groups where there's questions so that we can have those discussions as the groups meet. And my prayer, especially during this Advent, is that we come with anticipation, that we come expecting uh, to continue to meet the Lord as we gather. Now, the peace of the Lord be with you. Just acknowledge one another with a sign of God's peace. Welcome to Intercessor Church. We are so glad to have you here. God values you and loves you. His wonderful plan for your life starts with a relationship with him. At Intercessor, we follow Jesus' command to love God, love people, and build disciples. This is a place to grow and bring others alongside you. We look forward to connecting with you. We have over 40 trained individuals on our pastoral care team, Stephen Ministry. Stephen Ministers provide one-to-one -one care to those in need of support. If you are experiencing grief, loss, or other hardships, please send a request to connect with the Stephen Minister through the Intercessor app under Pastoral Care. If you think you'd be a good fit to become a Stephen Minister, send an inquiry through the app. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Be Our second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 10 through 14. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, 
not in revelry or, and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, nor in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. The word of the Lord. Please stand for a reading from the Holy Gospel. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power. Lord be with you. May the Lord be on our minds and on our lips and on our hearts as we hear his holy gospel. The holy gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Lord, we are reading from Matthew's gospel chapter 24 beginning at verse 37. But as in the days of Noah so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, if you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The Gospel of the Lord. We'll pray, Father, we're so grateful for this season of Advent, a time where we anticipate your coming, where there's hearts filled with expectation for who you are. And Lord, we know that you are here and you are in the midst of us, Lord, and we want to discover you maybe in a new way. Um, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, move in our hearts and minds to be open in that place, anticipating your promises, anticipating the things you want to speak, say, and do so we can leave here different. We want to be made different because we're in your presence. We want to leave here different because we're meeting with you. So continue to meet with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're beginning a new series, uh, The Promises of God, and uh, we also are beginning Advent for the next four weeks leading up to Christmas. So as we begin the first week of Advent, Advent is a reminder of the coming or the Adventus, which is really becomes this time that we take in these next weeks where there should be this expectation or this preparation or this anticipation for the coming of the Lord. And we know first we're celebrating that, that anticipation and expectation that took place 2,000 years ago in the birth of Jesus. But we're also living in a life in that expectancy as he will return. So we begin this new series, we're looking at these promises, and when we take a look at these promises, we're looking at what promises the Lord has made to us, and then why are they important? Why do these promises even matter? Well, when we look at the word promises, every one of us sitting here at some point in time has had a promise broken to us. It's just, it's happened. Someone has broken a promise to us in our life, and I guarantee it that every one of us has broken a promise to someone else. 
that at some point a promise was broken. Um, maybe you've been in that moment where you've had what we like to call those foxhole prayers, you know, those, those, those immediate prayers. And uh, I, I was really good at them at one point in my life. I, I mastered them because I had a lot of troubles I had to overcome. And I learned how to really talk to God in, in a crisis, in a circumstance, in something that I needed him to intervene. And for many of us, we might have those moments where we have those, those, those prayers of promise, right? They're, they're promise prayers. God, if you do this, then I'll do that. God, if you just come now and handle this thing, I promise I'm going to go to church. I promise I'm going to begin to live my life given to you and directed to you. And, and we, we go ahead and we want to make these promises to God. But what happens? We make promises that we believe that uh, will, will begin to create this change. But as a result, they don't create the change. We go on to live our lives and... And, and we make promises. And maybe some of those promises are just genuine right now. Maybe there's, God, help me if you remove some addiction that I have in my life, something that's controlling my life, Lord. I promise I'll begin to change my life and, and walk in a new direction. Or maybe there's a promise where there's misbehavior or abusive behavior and we're asking God to intervene. Or maybe there's these promises because we have too much self-indulgence. And we're saying, God, if you come into our life, that, that I promise I, I'll make this change, that you remove this. The problem is that on our own, it's impossible to keep a promise. We can't keep them on our own. We, we can't fulfill them on our own. They become empty promises. Now, what is a promise? A promise is fulfilling what you said you would do. That's what it means. A promise says... I promise I will do this, and then I actually do it. Isn't that crazy? I'll actually fulfill the thing I said I would do. Well, Herbert Lockyer, in his book, uh, All the Promises in the Bible, he, he tells a story of this school teacher. His name is Everett Storm, who, who sought after or do an extensive study to discover how many promises could possibly be in the scriptures. So he went and he began to apply himself, and he read through thoroughly Every word in the Bible, 27 times, it took him a year and a half to read through it. And what he underlined and what he came up with, that there are 8,810 promises in the scriptures. 7,487 are God's promises to humankind. It means most of those promises are to you and I, that he makes to us. And when we take a look at God's promises, we have to recognize something. Every promise has a precept. See, we look at promises and we're like, well, God promised this. But yeah, he promised it, but he also gave a precept with every promise. In other words, there's a guiding rule that takes place. So when we look at God's promise, that would be God's part, right? When we look at the precept, whose part is that? It's my part. So we look at Isaiah 41.10. It says, don't be afraid, for I'm with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. What's God's part? I will strengthen you, help you, and hold you up. What's my part? Don't be afraid and discouraged. See, the Lord can't strengthen us and he can't help us and he can't hold us up if we're in fear. So our part is that we won't be afraid, that we won't grow discouraged so that he would fulfill that. If we look at John 3.16, a scripture we might be familiar with, for God so loved the world that he gave what? His only son. That whoever believes in him would what? Not perish, but have what's God's part? Eternal life. That's God's promise. What's our part? we got to believe in him. <laughs> if we believe that scripture to be true, then we got to believe in him for that to be fulfilled in our lives. Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Usually we end there, and many people quote that. All things work together for good for those who love God. To those who are called according to his what? His purpose. What's God's part? 
working all things together for good. What's my part? Loving God. For him to work all those things together for that good, my part is i got to love God that he'll work those things together, that he'll do those things for his greater good. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Great text, right? I want the desires of my heart to be fulfilled. So what's God's part? His part is the desires of your heart. My part is delight in the Lord. See, if I don't delight in the Lord, and then I want the desires of my heart to be fulfilled, that's a pretty scary thing. Because I have to be delighting in the Lord, because that's where I find his desires. Not my desires, that's where I find his desires. And then they will be fulfilled because they're his desires that are now in my heart as I delight in who he is. 1 John 1.19, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's God's part? He's faithfully and justly forgives. That's God's part. What's my part? Confess my sins. He's faithfully and just to forgive us, but you got to confess it. If there's no repentance and confession, there's nothing to forgive, right? So, so his promise is absolution. His promise is forgiveness. My precept, my part, my guiding rule is I need to seek the forgiveness. I need to turn. I need to bring that repentance. James 4, 7, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What's God's part? A fleeing devil. That's a good part, right? A fleeing devil in our lives. But what's my part? Submit to God and resist the devil. See, he's not going to flee from me if I don't submit to God. He's not going to flee from me, and then if I'm not submitted to God, I can't resist the temptation, the deception, and those things that take place, that I have to recognize that, that I have to come to a place of submission to God. And as I submit my life to God, I now have the strength that I could resist what the devil would try to do in my life. And matter of fact, God promises he will flee from your life. Now, Numbers 23, 19, how we can look at these promises being fulfilled of what God says. It says this in Numbers. It says, God is not man, so he does not what, church? He doesn't lie. He's not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? What we need to be reminded is our God is a promise keeper. That he keeps his promises. He fulfills his promises. And the promises that he fulfills is he will bring deliverance, he will bring redemption, and he will bring salvation. These are promises that he's made. And he will see his promises through. And we read in Matthew 24 today where God, Jesus, is preparing his disciples before his crucifixion. And it's an apocalyptic reading. It's a, a preparation that we would understand of what he's going to fulfill and, and his coming again. And he's preparing his disciples. He's teaching his disciples what it means to begin to anticipate a promise which will anticipate his return again in his glory. And what that anticipation should be. So Jesus reminds them that his return will be like the days of Noah. When people were carrying on with their lives, what were they doing? It says they were eating and drinking and enjoying banquets, parties, and weddings. Right up to the moment Noah stepped foot on that boat. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating, drinking, banquets, parties, and weddings. That's not the problem. That's not it. It had to do with the indifference of the people having no place for God in their lives. Some crazy guy named Noah is in the middle of a desert building a boat where there is no rain. And they just chalk it off, that guy's crazy. And they're going on with their lives. And here's this prophetic symbol that's being built, this ark of salvation. And people are just going on with their lives, just living their lives, yet not even asking, hey, man, what's with the boat? What are you doing? Do you know something we don't know? Like, not even a question. And then it begins to rain. You know, when we read that story, it rained for 40 days and what? 40 nights. 
So day one, it's raining. They're like, oh, getting a lot of rain today. This is everyone else, right? Day two, wow, it's really been raining a lot. A lot of rain. This is odd. Day three, wow, the rivers are getting high, aren't they? Day four, wow, the water's coming into our house. This might be serious. And it, and it continues. But at, at what point did they not understand what, what, what message was taking place? Or what were they missing in that moment? Well, what they were missing was there was an indifference. There was a rejection. There was no need for God in their life as long as we had parties and celebrations and just going on with our everyday life, ignoring the most important thing that we need. So when we come to Advent and we look at what Jesus is reminding his disciples that God promises, that he's promising the coming of a Messiah. He's promised the incarnation. He's promised a king of heaven who would come to earth. That the kingdom of God is this dynamic reality, not a static idea. See, the enemy's plan would let you to believe that the kingdom of God is just some static thing. But it's a dynamic reality. It's present now. And what that means is it's God breaking into history to redeem and rule all who accept responsibility to follow him. God breaks into humanity. And then there's a responsibility to follow him, that we, we have a precept in our life, that we're going to follow him, that we're going to begin to live under his rule and his reign because he's the king. Amen. So Advent reminds us that, that he'll come again not just the coming of the Messiah, the incarnation, but he'll return. And he'll return in all his glory. And that day will actually be a final day, the final moment. So he tells his disciples in Matthew 24, 42, he says, Watch, therefore, do not do, for you do not know the hour the Lord is coming. He says, prepare yourselves, watch. So what do, what do we have to do? What he's telling his disciples, he's still telling us right now in this moment, is he's saying we need to anticipate the promise of Christ's return. That's, that's how we have to live our lives, in that anticipation of his return. So what's anticipating a promise? Anticipating a promise is positioning yourself for God's purpose to be fulfilled in your life. That's anticipating a promise, that, that I'm positioning myself for God's purpose to be fulfilled right now in my life, that I'm putting myself in that right way with God, in that right standing, in that right position. And this is where we begin to put our faith in motion, because it says that we would wait upon his return, but that wait is not passive. It's an active, moving, pressing in upon the Lord. It's, it's, it's waiting in that expectation and, and, and knowing of his return. And I think there's three things that we should do if we're going to anticipate a promise. As we're coming into this Advent season in preparation, in that reminder for our lives, there's three things that we have to do if we're going to anticipate a promise. One thing that we immediately have to do is recognize some guy built a boat. Maybe we want to pay attention to a boat being built in the desert. In other words, God's doing something extraordinary in the midst of the ordinary. And that if we're anticipating a promise, we're not ignoring the rain. That we're paying attention to the things around us, paying attention to our culture, paying attention to those distractions. And then we're coming with an expectancy and a preparation and a yearning and a desire for more of what God is placing upon us or God's readying us for. So there's three things. The first thing we need to do is press in. Press in to your relationship with God. That's what it means to anticipate. We've got to press in to that relationship. If faith is active, then we need to grow in it. That's what an active faith looks like, that we need to grow in our faith, that it needs to be actively growing in our lives. You know, there's a great difference between a weak faith and a great faith. And often I wonder in the parable of the sowing of the seeds, what's taking place in people's lives. In all the years I've been in ministry, and I've seen those who I believe have come to the faith, but then I've also seen the struggles where the heat comes and, and it scorches, or where it falls on a rocky path, or, or when, when the, the vines come and they begin to choke out its existence. And it has to do with a weak faith or a lack of faith, if faith really existed. But when I begin to press in, what I'm pressing into is, God, I'm expecting a greater faith in my life. 
I'm expecting things to be moved in my life. So a greater faith means that I need that seed to sow into good soil. And when it sows into good soil, then it can take roots. When it takes roots, then it can't be uprooted. It can't be shaken. It can't be moved. And then it begins to grow. And it grows and grows and grows till it's something even greater than we could have ever imagined. Amen. And that's the kind of faith we have to begin to walk in is a greater faith. And if we're struggling in faith, we need to press into God. And we need to discover a depth that maybe we didn't know before and recognize there's so much more that he wants to do and that our faith should always be growing, that, it, that we should always be in action and, and pressing into who he is so that we can continue to grow. See, we, we have to do, if we're going to press in, is we got to seek the Lord daily, Amen. not quarterly, not once in a while, not when I'm in the foxhole and I need him to come to my rescue in this moment. And believe it or not, I think he answers some of those prayers, by the way, because I'm living proof. There's a lot of other places I should probably be right now. But God had mercy and showed me grace, and he heard my cry. And my faith might have been weak at that moment, but he grew it. He said, I can use that prayer. Watch what I do. But then I had to press in. I had to continue to press in. Faith is active. So what do we do? We, we press in through prayer, building that relationship with who he is. We press in through his word because that's truth. We press into his sacraments because they're means of grace for our life. That's pressing in. That's what we do in anticipation of a promise. The second thing we, we have to do is we press out. First we press in to who he is. Then we press out. That's to share our life with other people. That, that's part of being a, a disciple of Christ is. It's not a, a life I, that I just live inclusive to myself. It's a life that's meant to be shared with those around me. That we're, we're meant to share the Lord, has prom what he's promised for us. We're meant to share. We're meant to share that promise with other people. So they can respond to his precepts. So they can begin to live in his promises. When's the last time I went to someone and said, do you know some of the promises God has made to mankind? Do you know what he wants to do as a result of those promises in your life? Now, what I want you to understand with, with all these promises, 7,400 and change are made to humankind. 7,400 and change, those promises are made to humankind. Do you know what his promise is for? His promise is for a relationship with each of us. So he desires above all things that those promises bring us to a place that's in a relationship with him. Finally, what do we have to do? That we press in, we press out, we got to press on. Pressing on means I'm going to remain steadfast and don't give up. Amen. Now let me tell you something. I'm good with pressing on when everything's going good in my life. When I've made my bills at the end of the month, I can press on. When my car didn't break down again and I have a bill I can't pay, I can press on. When my wife likes me this month, I can press on. When my kids like me, I can press on. When things are going in my direction, when things are going well, when things are all those things are happening in my life, I can press on. That's easy. But pressing on doesn't have to do with when it's easy. Pressing on doesn't have to do when everything's going in my favor. Pressing on has to do with not giving up. Not giving up when it becomes difficult. That I'm going to faithfully continue to pursue the Lord with all my might. And then when I do that, I can overcome every obstacle. I can overcome every trial. And here's what I want you to know. When we press on, that's where your faith gets greater. Faith doesn't get greater when everything's going good. Faith gets greater when everything is hard. Faith gets greater when the obstacle's in front of me, and I know God will get me over that obstacle. I know that God will lead me past that trial. God will bring me to a greater place if I press on with my life. That's greater faith. That's greater faith knowing he's moving things out of the way so his promises can be fulfilled. We have to press on. He tells, finally, his disciples in verse 24, Chapter 24, verse 44 in Matthew, he says, Therefore, you also be ready. Be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. 
ready ourselves. That we are to ready ourselves. That we continue to ready ourselves in that preparation. But we ready ourselves in that preparation that we're anticipating his promises are being fulfilled in our lives. Our part is the precepts to respond to those promises as a guiding principle that brings me to a deeper relationship with who he is. Anticipating a promise means that I'm ready to meet Christ now. I'm ready to meet Christ in this moment. And I'm going to continue to meet him moment by moment. You know, the promises and anticipating a promise, this is where we find hope. The hope is in what he's promised. The hope gives us assurance to carry on for another day. The hope gets us over our difficulty. But it's in the promises that we find that hope. And what I know is his hope doesn't disappoint us. Amen. And when I find that hope, what happens is it gives me a joy. And that his joy will fulfill us. The Lord's calling us each today to continue to anticipate his promise to be fulfilled. Our part is responding to his promises. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've made those promises to us. We thank you that those promises are being fulfilled. You know, I don't know where anyone's at right here, right now, in this place, or online and watching. And God wants those promises to be fulfilled, but there's a precept. There's a guiding rule. There's a response to a promise. And one of the promises is that if we come to a relationship with his son, Jesus, by grace through faith, there's a promise of eternal life. So our part is I have to repent and turn from my ways of doing things and submit myself to God. And as I do that, that he promises this eternal life, this abundant life. Well, there's a part we play that we have to allow that desire in our heart to become true. You have to ask him into your life in that way so he can begin to become and guide and direct your life to fulfill that promise. So I don't know where you're at, and, um, but I know he makes an invitation to come follow him to be his disciple. And if you want to follow him today and you want to become that disciple, I want to offer you a prayer that you can begin to have your heart transformed and begin this new relationship with who he is and those promises to be fulfilled in your life. So if you'd like to pray with me, just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I, I need you. I thank you for dying on a cross for my sin. I open my heart. I ask you to come in. Take control of my life and make me the person to follow after you all the days of my life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed with me, the most important thing is just let us know because we're committed to help you on this pathway of discipleship, on a pathway to follow him. That's where you're going to discover God's purpose. That's where you're going to discover, discover God's plan. That's where you're going to discover God's promises being fulfilled in your life. Amen? Amen. We're going to continue to worship the Lord in taking up our tithes and our offerings. Be a part of the vision and make your faith commitment for next year. Open the Intercessor app, click on the Faith Commitment tile, and fill out the form. Unsure how to fill it out? Here are some common questions and answers. What if I give regularly already? Thank you. We're grateful for you. Please still fill out the form so we can plan for next year. You can pray and evaluate if you'd like to increase or continue your current gift amount. What if I'm not sure how much to commit? Pray about it. This is the decision between you and God. Start with a percentage of your monthly income, such as 3%, 5%, or 10%. What if I have financial struggles? We understand. We will walk through any struggle with you. To get started, download the Ramsey Plus app. We have provided a one-year membership for everyone. Then, let's meet with someone on our pastoral care team. Thank you for making a difference for those around you and for those who are not yet here. Good morning. 
we'd like to do a song called uh, This Is My Father's World. And it was written by a pastor who uh, lived up near the Niagara Falls area and uh, really had um, a great appreciation for God's creation. I went yesterday with my family on a hike up in Cold Spring Harbor. And, you know, you're just in beautiful area and you just look around and you say, you know, my father created all of that. And that's what this guy, he, he, he wrote a poem called, This Is My Father's World. And uh, a few years after he died, his good friend um, wrote a, the music to it. And we'd like to do it for you here this morning. This is My Father's World. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. standing, please stand. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It's truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he assumed at the first coming the lowliness of human flesh and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago and opened for us the way to eternal salvation, that when he comes again in glory and majesty and all is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hope. And so with the angels and archangels, throne and dominions, with all the hosts of power in heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory. Without end, we exclaim, Holy, holy, holy Lord our God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like dew fall so they may become for us the body and blood of our lord jesus christ before he was given up to faith the faith lord before he was given to death the death he freely accepted he took bread and gave you thanks he broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance When supper was ended, he took the cup and again he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, drink this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is alive. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread and this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love together with our patriarch Craig and all bishops and clergy. Remember those for whom we now pray. Father, for our anticipa uh, anticipating hearts, Lord, for your second coming. Father, for an increase in faith and hope, but above all love. For the homeless, the poor, the imprisoned, the suicidal. We continue to lift up the names of our sons and our daughters, our grandchildren, and their spouses and children for generations to come that they may further your kingdom on earth. And now will be a time for you to lift up a special intention of someone that you know that needs a touch from the Lord. Draw our hearts to remember the poor and the broken. As we receive the body and blood of Jesus, may we be transformed to become the body of Christ to the world. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Blessed Mary, the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Joseph, our husband, and with the apostles, martyrs, and all the saints. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us a bold to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be in. The gifts of God for the people of God, take the remembrance of Christ, died for you, and feed on him in your hearts with thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank you. 
Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you just close your eyes a minute, I just want to pray a blessing. You know, the Lord was just sharing with me that for some of us here, you're letting your struggle define you, and that's not who you are. Mm -hmm. 
They need to walk in his promises. So don't let your circumstance define who you are in God. Let the victory that he brings into your life be that definition. Father, we pray right now that we would learn to walk in your promises that give us hope. That we would do our part, Lord, in our precepts. Those guiding paths, Lord, that help us to walk in the fullness of what you've promised. And I pray, I pray for those who are just struggling physically, those who are struggling spiritually, those who are struggling, Lord, relationally, those who are struggling financially. And God, we want you to meet us in those promises to fulfill what you want to accomplish. So I pray, Lord, would you bring those forth this day so we can walk in anticipation of who you are and what you already have done. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Now, remember the poor. Be kindly and affectionate one to another. May the watchful care of the Father, the quiet confidence of the Son, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love and care for this day and forever. Amen. Let us go forth into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like God's. Sing it one more time, there is no God like, come on. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. Rock of salvation, it's a solid foundation. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. Thank you for coming to worship with us today. Get home safe, stay warm.